Osama bin Laden, the man who ordered the attack on America. 9-11, the trauma of New York. For 10 years, the USA hunts down its public enemy number one and finds him where no one suspects him. He is killed in Abbottabad, Pakistan on May 2nd, 2011. Private papers fall into the Americans' hands during the operation. Some of them are published later online. They offer a glimpse into Osama bin Laden's life in his hideout. How he felt and what he thought. How he loved and hated. Osama bin Laden, up close and personal. Abbottabad, Pakistan, a city of 500,000 at the foot of the Himalayas. Abbottabad benefits from a mountain climate and cool summers. June marks the beginning of the season. Affluent Pakistanis from the hot southern regions enjoy the summertime freshness here. And Abbottabad is safe. After all, the Pakistani Army's military academy is based here. Good private and boarding schools equally thrive in this kind of environment. By Pakistani standards, a pleasantly calm atmosphere pervades the city. The district of Bilal town is not the most upscale neighborhood. Despite that, larger solitary compounds dot the area in an otherwise rural environment. None of the residents suspect that one of these compounds houses a man who is wanted all around the world, Osama bin Laden. He once spread fear and terror into the Western world. In his house in Abbottabad, a TV links him to the outside world. Occasionally in newscasts, he sees himself, the man who many regard as the world's most dangerous terrorist. For the Americans looking for him, he has vanished into thin air. In his hideout, he views the videotapes displaying, in his opinion, his greatest triumph again and again. September 11, 2001, the attacks on the World Trade Center in New York, which killed almost 3,000 people. Roughly 10 years later, bin Laden wants to publicly savor his terrible triumph one more time. In his compound, he writes to a confidant. We are awaiting the 10th anniversary of the blessed attack on New York and Washington. You are well aware of the importance of taking advantage of the anniversary in the media. We have a lot to show. If Al Jazeera shows responsiveness, we should tell them that we are willing to cooperate. Tell them that we suggest that they make a documentary on this anniversary and we will provide them with printed, audio and video material. We should also look for an American channel that can be close to being unbiased. Original quotes from bin Laden himself, according to the US government. It has posted 103 documents on a website. Materials seized in Abbottabad in 2011, mostly on hard drives. Though bin Laden is very outspoken in these documents, still, they don't reveal how he came across face to face. British journalist Peter Bergen experienced this firsthand. I met bin Laden in 1997 in eastern Afghanistan. It was his first television interview. Um, you know, he came across as um, serious, well-informed, um, very low-key. You know, he was not sort of, I didn't know what to expect. I thought, you know, was he going to be thumping the table and shouting? He wasn't. He was very even. On September 11th, 2001, 
Osama bin Laden humiliates the global power, USA. That same day, he's in a cave in Afghanistan. Sitting among his followers, he keeps count as the hijacked planes hurtle into their targets, one after the other. This is the day when he becomes the most well-known terrorist in the world, and the most wanted. It wasn't something handed down to him. Osama bin Laden was born in 1957 in Saudi Arabia, a country marked by old traditions and rapid change. Oil makes the desert nation rich, but big money brings the modern era with it. Consumption and decadence start to compete with the Bedouin's simple life. Osama bin Laden is not among the losers in this change. He is one of 54 children sired by Mohammed bin Laden, a developer who became extremely wealthy as a result of Saudi Arabia's construction boom. A widely branched family, the bin Ladens gain ever greater prestige and influence. It was really quite a, an organized clan. And uh, under Islamic inheritance law, uh, Osama would have known uh, as a recognized son of Mohammed bin Laden that he would, that he would have a, a significant fortune um, after his father died. Like many Saudis of his generation, young Osama loves some of the novelties. Cars are his passion. He enjoys playing soccer, too. In Jeddah, he attends one of the most modern elite schools in the country. Osama's gym teacher at the Al Taga Model School comes from Syria, where he was a member of the Islamist Muslim Brotherhood. Now he lives in exile in Saudi Arabia. The teacher deliberately tries to influence young bin Laden's political views. So uh, Osama had this very distinctive experience in elite, an elite educational setting, influenced by European curricula, but also educated by Syrian Muslim Brotherhood activists who saw Islam as a source of political change, not just personal faith and practice. Osama bin Laden studies economics and business administration at King Abdulaziz University in Jeddah but he is drawn to lectures held by Islamic scholars. One of them, Abdullah Yusuf Azam, spurs the faithful on to wage jihad, holy war. Muslim soil must be defended against the hegemony of the infidels. The armed struggle to accomplish this ought to be fought throughout the Islamic world. Afghanistan. Here, jihadists literally go into combat against hostile invaders. Soldiers from the socialist Soviet Union have occupied the country. Firm conviction causes many young Saudis to be drawn into this holy war. Yet a thirst for adventure is there too. As of 1984, Osama bin Laden is one of them. His presence turns him into a celebrity back home. 1990, deployment of US troops in Saudi Arabia. Their mission, to liberate neighboring Kuwait, which has been occupied by the Iraqi dictator, Saddam Hussein. Bin Laden feels that the presence of U.S. troops in his homeland is an affront to the Muslim world. The holiest sites in Islam, Mecca and Medina, lie in Saudi Arabia. The Russians' withdrawal marks the end of Bin Laden's adventure in Afghanistan. The militant fundamentalist looks for a new sphere of activity. At the time, he even made an offer to Defense Minister Sultan to form an army of volunteers to set against the Iraqis. When the minister and the king rebuffed this notion, Osama bin Laden opted for opposition instead. Da begab sich Osama bin Laden in die Opposition und ab dem Moment ähm, scheint er über Wege nachgedacht. Starting then, he appears to have thought about ways to take action against Saudi Arabia and its foreign backers, even by force, primarily against the United States. Also in erster, äh, an erster Stelle die Vereinigten Staaten. 
This hatred towards America culminates in the attacks on September 11, 2001. The Americans strike back. The hunt for bin Laden is on. At first, VS CIA squads in Afghanistan. But they're unable to catch bin Laden. Even when US armed forces head into the Hindu Kush region in late 2001, the quarry is nowhere to be found. For years, the Americans presume that bin Laden is hiding in the mountains of Afghanistan or the tribal regions of Pakistan. The, the search for bin Laden and the decade that that took, I think at times was a, it, there was a source of an enormous frustration for the intelligence community, if not, if not almost embarrassment, right? How could you have all of these resources, all of these people devoted to this search and turn up so little? Um, there were, um, in terms of the public investment in this, it waned at times, right? There were other things that were happening. There was the invasion in Iraq and that ugly aftermath of the war in Iraq, um, the unraveling of that war. I mean, that diverted not only resources from the search for bin Laden, but diverted the public's attention from the search for bin Laden. Yet since 2005, bin Laden hasn't had to live in mountain villages or caves anymore. In 2004, a Pakistani middleman buys several property lots in a suburb of Abbottabad. He spends $50,000 and applies for a building permit. The client's order calls for a domicile with space for about a dozen residents. In 2005, construction workers erect a house. The neighborhood has been chosen with care. A large portion of the population in Bilal town are retired people, or semi-retired if you like, those who've taken up some occupation after post-retirement. Um, it's, um, it's, it's not an active region. It's not where people get up at 6.30 in the morning and start doing things. It's more like a sleepy place where the day starts at about 9 o'clock. And those who get up earlier than that are the exception, not the rule. Um, it, it's, um, there's not too much social interaction. Walls enclose the house, not unusual in a culture that shields women from strangers' eyes. Shaukat Kadir knows the situation in Abbottabad. The compound is a large one. It was a very large compound. Uh, but most houses in most uh, villas in, in uh, Bilal town have an equal size of compound. It's about uh, five canals of land in the local language, which comes to about uh, uh, 2,500 square yards of land. That's not too much either. It's a very large compound, but um, for most middle-class families in that region, this wouldn't be too large an accommodation. Uh, it's not all that expensive either from uh, that point of view. Bin Laden writes letters, memos and messages in his hideout. He knows he has to be very careful. There is no internet in the house, no mobile phones either. However, he is not completely isolated here either. If we don't forget he had a lot of time on his hands. So he would write 46 page memos to his lieutenants uh, and then he would you know, put it on a thumb drive and give it to a courier. The couriers were, you know, they were, they were perfect for bin Laden because they were also his bodyguards. They spoke Arabic because they grew up in Kuwait, but they came from this part of Pakistan, so they spoke the local language. So it was, you know, they were really were able to present themselves as locals because they kind of were. The couriers relay bin Laden's messages, most of which are stored on USB thumb drives to intermediaries. The neighbors only know the two Pakistani brothers, Arshad and Tariq. Nothing about the compound's high-profile resident. Arshad Khan, one of his couriers, systematically shields bin Laden from their view. One of, one of the things that he said, uh, told, shared with his neighbors was that he had an elder uh, uh, uncle staying with him, with his uh, wife and children, and he was not well. So that was the excuse, the other excuse for 
not mixing with people. You know, they were being very, very careful about security. So if a kid would knock a soccer ball or cricket ball over the wall, the bodyguards inside the compound wouldn't return the ball, wouldn't let the kid in. The bodyguard would come out and give somebody 50 rupees to just go away and you know, forget about it. Uh, you, you, they were not letting anybody into the compound. Bin Laden doesn't live all by himself in the compound. He has gathered part of his family here. He always advocated that it's good custom for Muslims to have four wives, which corresponds to common practice, at least among conservative Muslims in Saudi Arabia. Marrying two, three or four women is nothing special if the financial means are there. Two of his four wives are with him in Abbottabad. Two of his younger children are even born here. Living in a quasi-conspiracy, this can become a real challenge, as bin Laden writes in one of his letters. One of the most important security issues in cities is controlling children by not getting out of the house except for extreme necessity like medical care, and that they do not get to the yard of the house without an adult who will control the volume of their voices. On the compound, there were a dozen kids Bin Laden's kids and then also grandkids. Only very few photos of these younger children exist. The two educated wives, there was sort of a, you know, almost like a classroom and they would teach them and then Bin Laden would come and sort of instruct them about various things. The patriarch visits the classroom almost every day. He shows interest in his children's progress. Bin Laden was very nice to his kids and his family. I mean, you know, people, it's, it's not unusual that people who conduct acts of mass murder uh, have, you know, at least one part of them that is sort of nice. And uh, Bin Laden was certainly a committed father. He would read poetry to his kids. He would kind of instruct them on the Quran. Letters written by his grown children who can't be with him, speak of affection toward their father. We constantly yearn for you and delight in hearing your voice messages, writes one of his daughters. His son Hamza lets him know, my beloved father, I could not imagine the length of this bitter separation. My eyes still remember that last day they saw you. Bin Laden's answer is equally affectionate. By God, I miss you so much. The only thing we're lacking is getting together with you. And yet, in comparison, the terrorist leader knows how good he is faring in his hideout. It, it must have been a bit boring sometimes because he couldn't leave. Uh, but, you know, he was the world's most wanted man. And he's living, he wasn't on the run. You know, he was living in this house for five and a half years. He had his family. Now, most people, when they're on the run, don't take you know, two or three wives and a dozen kids and grandkids with them, right? It's quite unusual. Well, he had them all with him. The search for bin Laden poses a challenge for U.S. investigators at CIA headquarters in Langley, Virginia. Their work demands a lot of time and even more patience. Well, they always had a dedicated unit of analysts who became essentially target analysts. So their responsibility was to collect and uh, synthesize and analyze all of the information about where he might be and to then send out messages to CIA stations around the world asking them to follow up on one clue or another clue. It was obvious from 2002 forward that there was some kind of courier network serving bin Laden because his tapes came to Al Jazeera and to other outlets by some means. There had to be some handing. So the CIA was searching for those couriers, trying to follow the trail back uh, from when the tapes were dropped. And this was an obvious uh, course of investigation. And uh, along the way, some information started to surface about the important names in this courier network. As of 2010, the Americans keep a man under surveillance who once had connections to Al-Qaeda, 
and apparently provides courier services in Pakistan. They don't know who he works for yet. Al-Qaeda's third in command, Atiyah Tala, warns Osama. I previously wrote to you my opinion that we should reduce our correspondence. But bin Laden doesn't want to reduce contact any further. He writes, the facts prove that the American technology and advanced systems cannot capture a Mujahid if he does not make a security violation that will lead them to him. Imagine trying to control a global organization without using the phone or email. I mean, that's how bin Laden was. But he, you know, he had some control because he was able to get these messages out on thumb drives through couriers to people. But it was, you know, you know, it might, he had no idea if the message got through, it might take months for a reply to come. I mean, it was a very, it was like running an organization in like the early 19th century where you would, you know, send somebody physically with a message. It is not without consequences. There are sub-commanders who question bin Laden's authority. One of them writes, no doubt that one's distance, due to security situation and other reasons, from reality can weaken his precise vision, being chased, besieged, and distant is not the best environment for thinking and for forming the right opinion and decision. Even so, he at least manages to stipulate rough guidelines for Al-Qaeda's global activities, and it seems he also manages to have a say regarding operational details in individual cases. However, the fact that he has to communicate exclusively using couriers makes this difficult, which is why he naturally can't engage in planning attacks like those in London in 2005. But it seems as if he was at least still able to influence the broad focus of all these attacks, and he appears to have been well informed about current strategy. Yet the operational leadership no longer considers bin Laden to be a decisive factor. He starts to set other priorities. We need to understand that a huge part of the battle is the media. He's not pleased at all with how the media is portraying him. In the past, I watched some programs about me that relied on incorrect information. If the person does not disclose his history, then the media and the historians will make up some history for him, whether right or wrong. Well, he's, he's obviously a narcissist in many important ways. He sees himself as indispensable to uh, the struggle, to his own faith, to world history. And uh, there's a megalomania in his actions and uh, in his sense of self. Now, he could in person come across as quite uh, retiring and even humble, but in, his, uh, in the choices that he made and in the, the way he uh, defined himself as a leader, he was clearly a narcissist and quite vain as well. He keeps intervening. In late 2004, fierce fighting breaks out in Fallujah, Iraq. US troops temporarily lose the city to Iraqi resistance groups, among them Al-Qaeda in Iraq. In a letter written in 2004, before his time in Abbottabad, bin Laden spurs the insurgents on. Most sincere regards to the free people in the land of Al Anbar, especially the people in Fallujah, a town that is standing strong and refused to be humiliated and subjected by all of the infidel leaders. It taught them a lesson in consistency and principle and proved to them that the strength of faith is greater than that of planes and cannon shelling. But the leadership of Al Qaeda in Iraq is hard to keep in check. In 2004, Abu Musab al zarqawi a Jordanian who later became the head of al-Qaeda in Iraq, allied himself with Osama bin Laden. He had pledged allegiance to bin Laden, although all the experts knew he didn't have very much in common with al-Qaeda. A native of Jordan, al zarqawi is viewed as extremely vicious and unpredictable. He wanted to remain independent to fight the battle his way. al zarqawi is not only fighting against American forces. Time and again, Al-Qaeda in Iraq carries out attacks on Iraqi Shiites. As a result, 
primarily it's Muslims who become the victims of Islamist terror. In a letter from 2007, bin Laden cautions against the consequences of these actions. I am afraid that if they continue using techniques such as this, they will spoil and alienate the people. Our brothers are making things worse by opening themselves up to evil and hostility. There was tension there at the, at the outset in an effort um, by bin Laden and, his, and those closest to him to try to exert some influence to sort of check this group in Iraq, to yank its leash from time to time. Um, and ultimately, they couldn't hold on to that leash. That leash was, uh, was broken a couple of years ago, and the Islamic State has emerged as an organization with, with more resources and seen now as a greater menace. America remains the main adversary for bin Laden, no matter where or when. In Afghanistan, too. In a letter to a like-minded comrade, he depicts what he considers the best method. Al-Qaeda concentrates on its external big enemy. The enemies of the Ummah are a malicious tree with a huge trunk that has many different sizes of branches, including the countries of NATO. We want to cut this tree at the root. Our strength is limited, so our best way to cut the tree is to concentrate on sawing the trunk of the tree. For example, if we were on the road between Kandahar and Helmand, and army vehicles of Afghanis, NATO and Americans drove by, we should choose to ambush the American army vehicles, even though the American army vehicles have the least amount of soldiers. We will continue to pressure the Americans until there is a balance of terror. Yet all this is happening far from Abbottabad, where all the allegedly most dangerous man in the world can do is to make a daily tour of the yard. He is extremely cautious to avoid being discovered. The residents keep to themselves. They even burn their trash instead of having it collected. Bin Laden wants the household to be self-sufficient in every possible way. So the bodyguards were bringing goats that they bought locally and they would slaughter them. Uh, I saw uh, there were areas where they were keeping cows for milk. I saw uh, chicken coops where they were keeping chickens for eggs. I saw uh, all sorts of vegetables they were growing. I saw cucumbers, maybe lettuces. Um, it was a completely self-sufficient environment. Uh, they, and you know, there was a practical side of this, which is the more you can keep it you know, the more you can grow yourself, the less you need to go out and buy stuff. And they were being security conscious in that sense. Bin Laden has reason for caution. His hideout is within the Americans' reach. Since 2009, they've been flying more and more special missions from their bases in Afghanistan. Night after night, a unit is airdropped somewhere to search houses and take out key opponents. The Americans deploy another weapon to serve this purpose too, drones, unmanned remote controlled aircraft. Bin Laden is aware of the threat. He writes, The spying war and spying aircraft benefited the enemy greatly and led to the killing of many jihadi cadres, leaders and others. This is something that is concerning us and exhausting us. for the CIA, this was a, a capability that those involved in counterterrorism mission, um, they just saw its potential sooner than their counterparts in the military, who regarded this as this odd aircraft, what, what possible use could this be? It's, you know, um, they didn't see what it could do as quickly or readily as the CIA did. And so the CIA basically adopted this, adopted this platform, adopted this aircraft and developed it. Um, and, has, um, and has enhanced it uh, in ways that um, are quite remarkable, right? I mean, there is, there is almost a choreography now um, to the way that they conduct surveillance and even strikes with drone aircraft. In 2009, a drone strike in the Pakistani-Afghani border region kills bin Laden's 30-year-old son, Saad. He belonged to the top echelon in Al-Qaeda and had been tipped 
as his father's successor. Osama bin Laden writes about his son's death. May he accept him among the martyrs and elevate his stature, and may he have him in the company of the prophets, the lovers of truth, the martyrs and the righteous people. We also pray that God reward us for this loss and grant us a successor. He gave his sons um, mixed messages. At times, he urged them to follow him into the fight. At one point, according to um, a memoir published by one of his sons, he even urged his sons to become suicide bombers, which is a little bit hard for, for us to uh, fathom. Uh, but there's also writing uh, that he did at times under pressure. Uh, for example, his last will and testament at Tora Bora, where he tells his sons, uh, get out of the family business. Uh, I've, I've uh, suffered, I've caused enough suffering in your lives. He is behind the massive use of drones. U.S. President Barack Obama. And he is the Americans' key military commander, General Petraeus. Both of them become targets of Osama bin Laden's fantasies of revenge and omnipotence. I asked to prepare two groups with the mission of anticipating and spotting the visits of Obama or Petraeus to Afghanistan or Pakistan to target the aircraft of either one of them. Obama is the head of infidelity. As for Petraeus, he is the man of the hour in this last year of the war, and killing him would alter the war's path. Those are the sorts of things you can't rule out, but seemed increasingly unlikely, seemed increasingly um, almost as if he, you know, evidence that bin Laden had lost some grip on the reality of the organization he was running uh, and its capabilities. Uh, so it was sort of a pie in the sky idea. Yet bin Laden views himself as a realist. He thinks he knows his enemy and writes. One of the most important matters when there is a conflict between two sides, each side needs to be informed about its enemy's culture, history, his way of thinking. He was our enemy before Islam, and he increased his animosity after Islam. It is the Western civilization that occupied our land for 1,000 years. The Greeks 400 years, the Romans 600 years. Yes, I think it was a narrative of a sort of preordained history rooted in certain interpretations of uh, Islamic texts and Islamic forecasts uh, that he had grown up with, but really distorted by uh, the kind of campfire conversations among all of these exiled radicals uh, in these conflict environments. Uh, and they, they kind of created their own mythology to explain um, what they were doing, uh, why they mattered, and uh, how it would all lead to um, a, an important and successful transformational outcome. He didn't understand the United States at all. I mean, and we know now that he visited the United States once uh, when he was a relatively young man. Uh, he didn't have much first-hand knowledge of the United States. Um, some of the people in his family, he had a big family, some of them studied in the United States, understood it pretty well. But he himself, I think, had a very su surface understanding. And, you know, the bin Laden bookshelf that he had at his house, I mean, it's full of, it's, it's full of works by Noam Chomsky and sort of critics of American foreign policy. That's all fine, but it's only one part of the picture. Uh, so he didn't, I think his view of the United States was kind of incomplete. And, and also he was reading, as some people do, stuff that really simply reinforced his own views. The picture bin Laden has of Germany is homespun too. He believes he knows the easiest way to hurt it. Boycotting German automobiles means harm to the automotive sector first, and with it other companies will be hurt also, such as BASF, the largest chemical company in the world, and also the steel industry. Both are important sectors in Germany. Boycotting the German automotive industry will lead to the loss of jobs. Advice? Avoid talking about the Jews and Palestine when talking to Germans. This subject is very sensitive in Germany and will bring negative results to our goal. However, in bin Laden's eyes, the main adversary is the USA. 
America has to stop its evil, such as the support for the Jews, and leave the Muslims alone so the Muslims can establish an Islamic state where Islam will prevail. We want to fight the United States, the leader of the infidels. It is a known fact that the American people, who are represented by the Congress and the White House, are the holders of the supreme power in the U.S., and they are the ultimate decision makers. Thus, we have to focus on killing and fighting the American people. In a nutshell, until 2011, Al-Qaeda was one of history's most violent terrorist organizations. Their goal was to attack and kill civilians in the U.S., but also in the rest of the Western world. Bin Laden makes some calculations. The population of the U.S. is 300 million. 1,000 soldiers were killed in Afghanistan and 4,000 in Iraq. This means that only a small number of them were impacted, which is not enough to make the American people revolt and force the politicians to stop the war. As long as we want to achieve our main objective, we have to conduct our operations inside the U.S. One large operation inside the U.S. will affect the security and nerves of 300 million Americans. Thus, our main war should be directed to put pressure on the American people inside the U.S. New forms of terror aren't the only thing bin Laden thinks about in his hideout. Other worries plague him too, as his letters show. Please send me a complete statement on my fund. Also, please send me $30,000 from my personal fund. If there is not enough money in my personal fund, please take money as a loan from the general account. Al-Qaeda was strapped for cash very, very often, even though it was a very wealthy terrorist organization in its time. That's why Osama bin Laden was forced to live on a very modest scale for years. But ideology plays a role here, too. He emulated his Saudi and Yemeni forefathers. In so-called Wahhabism, the interpretation of Islam prevalent in Saudi Arabia, a very austere life plays a key role. It's an ideal. As a result, bin Laden lives almost as unassumingly as the ordinary people in his neighborhood in Abbottabad. They were living in relative discomfort, I would say. The main house had uh, one sitting room uh, with a kitchen. It had uh, two bedrooms on each floor, the ground floor, the first floor, and the second floor. So there were a total of nine bedrooms for 17 people. Another resident is supposed to join them from Tehran. Bin Laden's wife, Kiria, has been held in Iran, the nation led by Shia mullahs, for years, along with several of their children. Well, an Iranian diplomat had been taken hostage by Al-Qaeda, effectively, in, uh, and they held him, I think, for a couple of years, and the Iranians wanted this diplomat back, and uh, they had something Al-Qaeda really wanted, which was bin Laden's family members who'd been living in Iran under a form of house arrest, so a deal was made and um, it was essentially kind of a prisoner swap. Bin Laden wants to have Korea join him, but his Pakistani backers disapprove, as he writes to his wife in late 2010. I have been living in the company of some of the brothers from the area for years, and they are getting exhausted, security-wise, from me staying with them. They are shutting down, and they asked us all to leave. They mentioned that our number is large and beyond what they can handle. Bin Laden is willing to take a major risk for his wife's sake and even leave the safe house to meet her in secret. He asks a trusted aide in a letter. With God's permission, I will visit her. In your opinion, what is the suitable time for movement from our area to your area? Is it after sunrise when movement is weak because of the extreme cold? Or is it after sunset? Is it suitable for the brothers to take me to the place where I met with the brother from our side a while ago in the neighboring city? The letter suggests that he left the house at least once.
It's pretty amazing that unconfirmed information in his papers reveals that he left the compound. It's hard to picture a major figure as striking as Osama bin Laden being able to move around unnoticed in Pakistan. Then again, it is a chaotic country with only one effective entity, the army. Whether in a van or otherwise, it seems that Osama bin Laden and parts of his family were successfully brought across Pakistani territory into the tribal regions and back again. In early 2011, his wife Karia actually joins him in his hideout. He had advised her beforehand. Our security situation does not allow us to go to doctors, so please take care of all your medical needs and keep the prescriptions from every doctor you go to so we can get you the medication when you come to us, God willing, whenever you need it. We have three wives who varied in age from 63 to 29. Uh, and Mal was the youngest one, she's the Yemeni, and she, he had recent, she was his most recent bride, and he was living in the bedroom with her. And then he had you know, these two other wives, uh, who were also living in the house, and, you know, he had good relations with them. By that time, CIA search units are already keeping the compound in Abbottabad under airborne surveillance. From the ground as well. They even count the pieces of laundry on the clothesline to figure out the number of inhabitants. Yet, they never catch sight of bin Laden himself. Since early 2011, U.S. President Obama has received regular reports on one of the residents of the house in Obotabad, who was identified as a member of Al-Qaeda and apparently works as a courier for an important person. One of the things the CIA did was, okay, what are the alternative explanations for this? Is this a drug dealer who is just keeping a low profile, which is perfectly plausible in that part of the world? Is this some peep member of Al-Qaeda that has not been Laden? There were alternative explanations, but none were as good as potentially has been Laden. After nearly 10 years of fruitless searching, finally, a hot lead. At the White House, President Obama decides it's time to act. In the spring of 2011, he sends Navy SEALs to Abbottabad. Whether they're actually going to find bin Laden there is anything but certain. This was not an easy decision. This, there were doubters in that room who were arguing against, against proceeding in this way, proceeding with a raid instead of just dropping a bomb or sending a drone. The president reportedly also decides not to notify the Pakistani government in advance. However, some issues regarding Pakistan's role still remain. I do think there are aspects of the hunt for bin Laden uh, and the um, communication uh, with the Pakistanis that we may not know everything about. Uh, in history, these kinds of very sensitive, secret, fugitive hunts, they usually reveal a few layers as the years go on and as, and as more documents become available. Today, the essential facts are commonly known. U.S. Navy SEAL commandos take off from the USA on April 26, 2011, and arrive in Afghanistan after a stopover in Rammstein, Germany. They were not convinced that bin Laden was there. They, some people thought it was very likely, some people thought it was maybe. And um, it was a very, I think, look, I think President Obama made, uh, you know, clearly he made the right decision. I think he made a very tough call. On the evening of May 1st, 2011, two commandos set off for Abbottabad from a US base in Jalalabad in Afghanistan. Their flight leaves around 11 p.m. and takes about 90 minutes. The Pakistani Air Force doesn't react to it. There was no aerial threat from Afghanistan, from our western borders. There was no threat by air, or incursion by air, from Afghanistan. The aerial threat was all from India. So all our radars and anti-aircraft devices were placed on that border not on this border. What is more, the Americans knew which areas were totally undefended, where there were no people. And they could fly through those valleys, low fly through those valleys, which, and they could gain entrance, which is what they did. That night, Osama bin Laden goes to bed as usual, on the third floor of the house, in the bedroom he shares with his wife, Amal.
1 a.m., U.S. Navy SEALs infiltrate the compound. One of the commando units kills bin Laden's two couriers and one of his adult sons during a firefight. Another unit heads off in search of the target. Osama bin Laden offers no resistance. A few hours later, a VTOL jet lands on the US aircraft carrier Carl Vinson, stationed in the Indian Ocean. Bin Laden's body is on board. The Americans have left his wives and children behind in a Abbottabad, handcuffed. On the aircraft carrier, Bin Laden's body is prepared for burial according to Islamic ritual. Bin Laden is given a burial at sea. This way, his body will never be found. I mean, you know, in Islamic uh, custom, you're supposed to bury within 24 hours, and I mean, they didn't want Bin Laden to bury his burial place to be a place of pilgrimage. And so, you know, the, I think the sea burial was the least bad option they came up with. At the same time, the world at large learns of the terrorist leader's death. Tonight, I can report to the American people and to the world that the United States has conducted an operation that killed Osama bin Laden, the leader of Al Qaeda. It was a big story, but it wasn't, you didn't have billions of people protesting. And you didn't, I think the reason for that is bin Laden did not die on the battlefields of Tora Bora in Afghanistan fighting the Americans. He died in a suburban compound surrounded by his wives and kids. He put up no resistance. It was not a heroic end. He, he didn't go out with a bang. He went out with a whimper. The focus of global attention shifts overnight to the city of Abbottabad and the mysterious house in Bilal town. Neither spectators nor journalists are allowed to enter the compound itself. Though there are some exceptions. I was amazed, I, I must admit. They surprised at the lack of security that there was, because one would, in this high technology era, one would have uh, visualized some high technological equipment for security of the house. There wasn't any, none at all. Following the dramatic events, as a former general of the Pakistani army, Shaukat Qadir is granted access to bin Laden's hideout. One aspect draws his attention. Somebody running away or hiding from the law what one begins to think of is that the first thing he must ensure is escape routes. Some escape routes. That's the first thing that I was looking for, that he should have some hidden escape routes, and perhaps the attack was such a surprise that he wasn't able to get there. But there were none. There were none. No CCTVs installed outside, which you could look at on the inside and say, OK, somebody's coming. Nothing like that at all. Very surprising. Pakistani authorities did not want bin Laden's house in Abbottabad to become a place of pilgrimage, so they have it demolished in 2012. Yet the memory of bin Laden is by no means erased by demolition. Bin Laden is much more than a historic figure because he made a very decisive mark in shaping today's world, using admittedly highly effective terrorist attacks that continue to define global politics to this day. He managed to induce a superpower to counterreact and to overreact. I think uh, his, his legacy is still significant because he played an important role in legitimizing in some Islamic radical circles uh, the taking of mass casualties uh, of civilians in the West and of creating shock events made for media. What we have now is a style of terrorism that, that bin Laden helped to invent, which is just the shocking mass casualty attack against soft targets. His means were violent, his strategies simple. He was set on using terror to combat American influence in the Arab world. The next step was to establish fundamentalist regimes in the Arab nations and ultimately unite them in a caliphate. Well, the real thing is the ideology. Bin Laden was the person who 
explain that ideology very clearly to a lot of people around the world. And unfortunately, the ideology continues to live. And I don't think it's gonna, I don't think it's gonna disappear.